In this problem, we're going to connect the math we've been looking at, in particular solving ordinary differential equations with Laplace transforms, with a mechanical vibrations or a mechanical dynamic system. So we're going to go through all the steps of developing our ordinary differential equation, or in this case, as we'll refer to it, the equation of motion, uh, and then solving it using a Laplace transform. So in this case, we have this simple spring mass damper system. So we have a mass which is connected to the spring and the damper in parallel, and we have a force being applied to it. And we're told in this case that applied force is just going to be a unit impulse. Uh, and we are told that this system is going to start with a position of zero and a velocity of zero. So x of zero is zero, x dot of zero is zero. We're starting at what we would call here equilibrium, zero initial conditions. So what's happening in this problem is we're starting at rest or at equilibrium, and as soon as we start our timer when time is zero, we're basically uh, hitting it with a hammer, we're just giving it a very quick impulse, and then we're going to see that the mass is going to move based on that impulse that we just gave it. So we're just hitting it for that uh, fraction of a second that the impulse lasts, and then it's going to, as we're going to see, uh, oscillate or move on its own from that impulse. So in our schematic here, we have uh, one degree of freedom in our system. That is to say that the only way the mass can move is vertically. It can move up or down, but only vertically. We're not allowing it to translate left or right in this model, and it also cannot rotate uh, around like a z-axis or any of the other axes. So we're going to see this is what we call one degree of freedom system. And uh, the degree of freedom or the coordinate system has been chosen for us that x is defined as positive down. All right, so where we want to go is we want to find really in the end what's x of t, what's the position of this mass, and we're going to simulate it over six seconds. So we will plot the result that we get to see what does the behavior of the mass look like when we give it this impulse. But where we're going to begin in these mechanical systems is, is we need a free body diagram or possibly multiple free body diagrams when we have more complicated systems. In this case, just one free body diagram. So we need to model the, in this case, the mass and what are the forces acting on the mass. And the reason for going to this free body diagram step first is we're going to use our free body diagram to develop our equation of motion which we're going to see is an ordinary differential equation, and that's what we're going to be solving for x of t. So what we're seeing here for the first time is where do these ODEs come from? In the pure mathematical examples we've been looking at, we're presented with some ordinary differential equation and some initial conditions, and we wanted to solve it, and we got some mathematical expression. Now we're going to see the context around it, that in this case, the ODE is coming from the, the mechanical system we have. So free body diagram of the mass is where we're going to start. And we're going to have uh, actually two parts to our free body diagram. We're going to have the forces uh, or potentially moments that are acting on our object of interest, in this case the mass, and then what we'll call the inertial diagram. How is that mass going to be moving? And really what we're looking here is we'll have F equals m a in the end. In this case, it's one dimensional, but it could be uh, multi-dimensional as well for more complex systems. So this picture is going to drive our Newton's law equation, which we're going to see is going to have uh, derivatives in it and be an ODE. All right, so let's look first at the forces that act on the mass. Uh, the order we do it in doesn't really matter. I'll start with this applied force, f of t. Now we are told that f of t for this particular example is going to be a delta, it's going to be a unit impulse. I'm going to start just generic with um, using my variables and my parameters, and then I'll put in the specifics later. That way we're, we're starting with a more general solution, and then if we wanted to change a parameter uh, or something like that, it's going to be pretty easy to do if we do as much as we can in variable form first. All right, so that's the first force acting on the mass, and we're told that when it's positive, it's down. I'm also going to put in our coordinate system here, again, x. Now, important thing on our coordinate system 
is one, it is going to be this uh, inertial frame. We can imagine that this um, X coordinate system is painted on, let's say, the wall behind the mass. So when the mass is moving, the reference frame does not move. We're always measuring that X from the same location. It's not attached to the mass itself. Um, and the way we have it here, when X is positive, that means when we measure from this line to, let's say, the center of our mass, when X is positive, that means the center of this mass is below this, at this coordinate system. And in this case, when X is negative, it's going to be above this coordinate system. Now, we could have defined X as positive up. That would have been uh, perfectly fine. Uh, as long as we're consistent with it, our answers are going to make sense. Uh, since I was given that X is positive down, I'm just going to stick with that for now. Uh, and another important thing about how we choose our coordinate system is always uh, our equilibrium point is always defined when our coordinates are all zero. So if we just have this thing sitting at rest, not doing anything, we better be measuring that x is equal to zero. Uh, otherwise, our coordinate system is not defined correctly. Because really what we're looking at is uh, perturbations off of equilibrium, and that's true for all of the systems we're going to be looking at. So if all of our degrees of freedom or our coordinates are zero at equilibrium, then it's set up correctly. All right, so going forward, uh, attached to the mass, we have this spring and we have a damper. Now, both of these are going to be applying a force on our object. Uh, the spring, and it could be a force up or it could be a force down, depending on, for example, in the spring, is the spring in tension or is the spring in compression? So to model springs and dampers for that matter, I'm going to suggest, although there are other, there's other ways to do this, I'm going to suggest we always draw the force in tension. And then we're going to develop the value of that force based on what would cause tension in the spring. Now, for springs, we know that the force in the spring is going to be based on Hooke's law equal to K times, uh, let's say, delta, although it's a different delta than we have for our impulse, so it's just, uh, I'll use a capital delta here. So it's the spring constant times the deformation of the spring. Now, the way that we define X here, when X is zero, the spring, we're in equilibrium, so the spring is going to be in equilibrium when x is equal to zero. So it's not going to be in tension or compression. And we're also going to be dealing here with a linear spring. Later we'll be looking at nonlinear springs possibly, but uh, for, the, for this case, we're going to say there's a linear relationship between the force in the spring and the deformation of the spring. All right, so what happens here is when m is moving down, when x is positive, the spring is going to be put into compression. And in this case, because the bottom of the spring and for that matter, the damper are both going to be uh, attached to the ground, which does not move. So only one side of the spring is capable of moving, uh, the top. So if X is positive, then the spring is being put into compression and the spring in turn would be pushing up on our mass. If the mass is above the equilibrium point when X is negative, that means the spring is going to be stretched so it would be a, a case like this. The spring is being stretched, and it's going to be put into tension, which means it's longer than it wants to be, and it would be pulling the mass down. All right, so again, that's what I'm going to suggest always drawing on our free body diagram is that tension state. So it's going to be the value of the force is going to be K times. Now this is going to change depending on what the value of X is. So what I want to write here is going to be negative k times x. So why did I write negative kx? That's because I want this value to be positive when the spring is in tension. So when does that happen? It happens again when x itself is negative. So I have a negative x times k. So when x is negative, I'm going to get a positive quantity for this arrow, and then the arrow is facing in the correct direction. However, if x is positive, I'm going to have a negative times k, which is always positive, times a positive x is going to be negative there, and then I'm actually in compression, but the value is negative, which means the arrow would actually be pointing up. 
which is correct when the spring is being put into compression here. So again, what we want to think about is based on the coordinate system, what value of x is going to put our spring and then we're going to see our damper into tension. In this case, a negative x is going to do that. All right, now we also are going to have a force from this damper. And the force of our damper, again, we're going to assume it's acting only in this uh, linear region. So there's going to be a linear relationship between b and I guess I'll call it delta dot for now. So the force in the damper is dependent on the velocity of the damper, whereas the force in the spring was dependent on the deformation or the position of the spring. So this has that time derivative. So what is its value going to be? Well, again, if we look at the damper here and how it's arranged, if x dot, the velocity of the mass, is positive, that means the mass is traveling downwards, which means that that damper is going to be compressed. So it's going to be put into compression. If our x dot is negative, meaning the mass is traveling upward, based on our figure, then this damper is going to be put into tension and it's going to want to pull down on the mass. So this is going to be the same idea here that negative b times x dot. I'm using again x dot because it's velocity dependent, whereas the spring was going to be position dependent. So again, how do we interpret this? If my x dot is negative, meaning m is traveling upward, then my damper should be put into tension. And that would be correct here because I'll have a negative b times a negative value of x dot. So the product is going to be positive. However, if x dot is negative, m is traveling downward, b is being put into compression, then I'm going to get a negative b times a positive x dot. My product is negative of that multiplication, and my arrow is actually should be pointing up because it's actually going to be pushing up on m. The damper will be pushing up on m as it travels. So we're going to get more practice with this, but the sign on these values we want to pay particular attention to. So both of these, if I assume tension in the spring, tension in the damper, are correct for these directions. And finally, on this mass, the other force that technically is acting on it would be its own weight, the gravitational force. Almost always, though, we are going to be ignoring the force of gravity in these free body diagrams. The force of gravity typically is going to be one much smaller than the other forces that are going to be acting on the object. So it's, we're going to be able to neglect it. It's not going to really change our answer that much. And because we're always looking at perturbations from equilibrium, it really doesn't come into play too much because we've already accounted for the weight force in uh, how much like the spring is being compressed in our system because we're measuring everything from uh, based on an unstretched length of the spring at the equilibrium point. So I don't need to include gravity in this picture. I will just have that applied force. I'll have my spring force and I'll have my damper. Right, so that was the hard part of the modeling on the left-hand side, all of the forces that act on my system. The right side, the inertial picture is going to be easy. All I do is I draw all the ways it can move in the positive direction. As I established before, this is one degree of freedom. It can only move up or down and I'm going to draw this arrow in the positive direction. And this is my mass times my acceleration. So if x is position, its second derivative x double dot is my acceleration. So again, I drew the arrow down because x was defined as positive down, and I get this mx double dot. So that's my free body diagram for this. I just have the mass to contend with, and I'm going to use this to develop my equation of motion, or EOM. And all the equation of motion is, for the mechanical systems at least, is that Newton's law, F equals MA. And this is, again, going to come right from our free body diagram. So what I want to do on the left-hand side is I want to sum forces in the x direction in my left-hand picture. So I need to base this on the direction the arrows point related to what am I defining as the positive direction of my coordinate system. In this case, x is positive down. So let me start with the, uh, the spring. All right, so that arrow is pointing down. So it's pointing with the positive sense of x. So I'm just going to copy 
the value it has right into here. And its value is negative k times x. So I just copy that right in. All right, and now the damper, its arrow is also in the positive x direction, so I will copy its value directly here, negative bx dot. And finally, I have my f of t, it's positive down, that follows the same direction as the positive sense of my axis, so it just gets plus f of t. In this case, all the arrows were along the positive direction of x. And that will equal then mx double dot. My right hand side is my inertia, my mass times my acceleration, and that arrow again is in the positive direction of x. Right, I'm going to rearrange my equation of motion a little bit in preparation for the next step. Uh, we see I have an x term, I have an x dot term, I have an x double dot term. What I want to do is I want to put all of my x's on one side and then all of my other terms on the right hand side. So I'm going to rewrite on the left hand side my mx double dot. I'm going to move my bx dot to the right hand side. I'll move my kx to the right hand side and that will equal my f of t. Right, so just to have kind of the standard way of presenting it, I have x and its derivatives on the left. I typically will write them in descending powers of derivatives. So second derivative, first derivative, zero derivative equals, and then the f of t is going to be left over. So this is my full equation of motion for this system. And if we look at it, it is an ordinary differential equation. Uh, I have functions of time, x, the position technically is a function of time. I didn't write it as x of t, but we know it's a function of time because we have x, we have its first time derivative, and its second. The dots are implying we're taking time derivatives of that variable. And then we have our forcing function, we have that f of t, uh, again, also a function of time. So time is our independent variable, and actually here we have two dependent variables, x, the position, and our forcing, f. All right, equation of motion is done. We have that ordinary differential equation. This is really where we would start in those previous pure mathematical examples, where we were just handed an ordinary differential equation. But here we see this is where they can come from, at least in a mechanical system, is how does the acceleration, the velocity, the position all relate to each other? That's what the equation of motion is telling us. Now we can go and solve it because ultimately we want to know x of t. We want to know the position of the mass at all points in time once that timer starts. So to solve this ordinary differential equation, I'm going to use the Laplace transform method like we've been talking about before. So I can take the Laplace transform of both sides of this equation. I'll skip a couple of the steps here. So one, I can take out my constants, and we know that the Laplace transform of a sum is the sum of the Laplace transforms. So we've seen a couple of examples like that. So I can jump ahead a little bit on what we're doing. And then I'll have the k times Laplace transform of x equals then the Laplace transform of f of t. Right, so again, that's just taking the Laplace transform of both sides and applying a couple of those Laplace transform rules, pulling out constants and splitting up uh, Laplace transforms of sums. At this point, it will be useful. I, I was given, uh, again, at the start, that f of t, that forcing function, is delta of t, the unit impulse. So at this point, I will replace that so that mathematically I'm going to be able to solve this. All right, so now I pulled in the relevant details from my Laplace transform table. Again, time domain on the left and S or frequency domain on the right. So taking the Laplace transforms, I am going to be apply, I'm going from the left side to the right side. So one term at a time, I have an M times Laplace transform of X double dot. Well, that's this 12B. I have this X double dot term, so I want to go left to right. So that's going to be an S squared times x minus an s times x of 0 minus x dot of 0 plus b times Laplace transform of x dot. Well, that's just 12a. So that's going to be s times x 
Again, these x, these capital X's are functions of s, uh, but I'm just not going to write them. Minus x of 0 plus k times Laplace transform of x. Well, that is just capital X equals the Laplace transform of delta t. That's 11b here going left to right. That is simply going to be 1. Right, so I've resolved these four Laplace transforms now at this point, and I can do some further simplification. Uh, so again, looking up here, initial conditions. We were told that we begin at equilibrium, so our initial position is zero, our initial velocity is zero. So these terms are all going to drop out. This goes to zero, and zero, and zero. And I can rewrite this now as m s squared x plus b s x plus k x equals 1. As before, I want to isolate my x term. So actually on my left hand side now, I can pull capital X out and I'll be have an m s squared plus a b s plus k left over equals 1. And now I can divide through. So I know that capital X is 1 over m s squared plus b s plus K. Right, so I have this intermediate solution here. I've isolated x. I'm still, though, in the frequency domain, so I will have to go a little bit further, but this in and of itself has helped us out. I still need to go and take inverse Laplace transforms here. At this point, I'm going to apply the values of my parameters. So going back up here, I'm using m is 1 the b is 5, so the damping coefficient is 5 newton seconds per meter base units, and my spring constant k, 6 newtons per meter. So let me apply those numerical values in for my x equation. So 1 over, uh, so again m is 1, plus b is 5, plus 6 in the denominator. With these parameters in place now, I can go and solve for x of t because I want to take an inverse Laplace transform. Uh, but if we see what we have right now, I have this 1 over s squared plus 5s plus 6. That right-hand side does not appear on the Laplace transform table. So I have to see, can I uh, algebraically manipulate this into something that does appear? So looking at the, the format of this, with the denominator being this quadratic, uh, possibly, I'm going to be able to use a partial fraction expansion. And again, this example is set up so that it is going to work out nicely. This is factorable. Uh, this is going to be here, uh, and 1 over s plus 2, s plus 3. So it does factor out um, because 2 and 3 multiply to 6 and add to 5. So by design, this one works out nicely. Uh, so my x is factorable, which means that I can do a partial fraction expansion and I can write it as two fractions. So a over s plus 2 plus b over s plus 3. Solving the partial fraction expansion, which I won't go into details here, we get a equals 1 and b equals negative 1. So we can rewrite this as 1 over s plus 2 minus 1 over s plus 3. Three. And now it's going to be in a form that does appear on the Laplace transform table, so we can do an inverse Laplace. So I'll take this and I'll copy it down here. And we want to go now from right to left. So I can take the inverse Laplace transform of both sides as the inverse Laplace of 1 over s plus 2 minus the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus 3. And now we can resolve these inverse Laplace transforms. Inverse Laplace of big X is x of t, little x of t in the back in the time domain. And now we can apply that rule 2 two times. So this is going to give me e to the negative 2t power minus e to the negative 3t power. And that is my complete closed form solution for this problem. By using the Laplace transform, I have my total solution, which is going to be the homogeneous and the particular solution all at the same time. And it built in my initial conditions.
In this case, we started at equilibrium, so the initial position was zero, the initial velocity was zero, but all of that was included in what we had here. So this is the x of t. This is saying what the mass, the position of the mass at all points in time after the timer starts. So this is only good for t0 and greater. This doesn't tell us what's happening before we started the timer, but we're not interested in that anyway. So um, we want to now simulate this or plot it over six seconds, and we'll be able to get a physical sense of what's happening in our system. So when we hit that mass with that impulse, how is it going to respond? How is it going to behave once we start that timer? And to do that, we're going to do our simulation in MATLAB. In MATLAB, I'm going to be simulating this for six seconds. That's what I'm doing in line four, where I'm establishing my time vector going from zero to six. And for here, I'm going to do a thousand time steps just so I get a nice picture, a nice smooth picture of the response of this mass once we hit it. And then in line five, I'm using that closed form equation we just came up with, e to the negative 2t minus e to the negative 3t to define x, the position of this mass. And then I'm just going to plot them against each other uh, so we can see what's happening. So if I run this whole first cell, then we can see graphically what is happening in our system. All right, so at time is zero. Uh, we're going to have our position be zero, which we we should be better because that is our initial condition, is that position was zero at time equals zero. And that's where we just hit it with this hammer. We just apply this impulse. So what happens is that the value of x increases to some peak value, which we see is around uh, 0.15 almost uh, meters. Now, keep in mind the way that we defined x was positive down. But the plot is showing that a positive x is up. But this actually means that the mass is all the way at the bottom. It's below the x-axis. Uh, it's below that horizontal at its peak value below that coordinate system. And then what's going to happen is it starts to reverse and it's going to come back up. It's going up at this point. If we see the slope of this line, uh, we see that it is a negative slope, meaning that x dot is negative, meaning the velocity is up. So it has this, this upward velocity, and it's going to keep going up and up, and it's going to slow down, and then it's going to asymptotically get back to that equilibrium position. If we look at the y value, the displacement, it's, it's getting closer and closer to zero, returning to that equilibrium position where it was resting before we gave it that impulse. So again, yeah, it starts at equilibrium, we hit it, and it's going to get down to some maximum, which is a maximum below the horizontal, and then it's going to start to return back up and then slowly get back to that initial equilibrium position. So to recap where we came from, uh, we started by making a free body diagram of our mechanical system. In this case, uh, looking at the mass as our object of interest, we put all of the forces that acted on our mass. And I recommend that for any spring, any damper you have in a system, that you're going to be assuming its intention or drawing it in tension and then coming up with what's the value of the position or the velocity that puts it into tension. Should it be positive? Should it be negative? On the right-hand side, we draw the inertia, and that's just going to follow our coordinate system. In this case, it can only move up or down. We use the free body diagrams to drive our equations of motion. So we're just doing uh, force equals mass times acceleration using the left picture of forces and the right picture of our inertia. And then I rearranged it so that our dependent variable with and it, our outputs, we call them, are on the left-hand side, x, and then our input, f of t is on the right-hand side. In this case, I was interested in finding x of t, so I used a Laplace transform method to solve my equation of motion, which is also my ODE. So using Laplace transforms and the Laplace transform table, we were able to use applying our parameters, and in this case, using a partial fraction expansion, we were able to get our closed form solution for x of t was this e to the negative 2t minus e to the negative 3t. And finally, we were able to plot that result
and graphically look at what this mass is doing when we apply an impulse at time equals zero seconds.